so um, we're, we're thrilled to be able to present this wonderful program to you tonight. Um, what we're going to be doing is honoring uh, Pierce uh, in a moment, but uh, before we do that, I would like to bring up the director of Fast Charlie, Philip Noyce. So, uh, officially I'm here to talk about Pierce, but I want to talk about Mark first, okay? Uh, <laughs> Because um, 20 years ago, he had my film Rabbit Proof Fence here, um, and then it played for four and a half months in this theater. The longest uh, run in any theater in America and the highest grossing theater in America for that film. Thank you, Mark. And then as we, myself and Pierce will fill you in on all the travails and the pleasures of making this movie that you're seeing tonight, we'll do that through the, afterwards, before, and in a bar, when we see you later. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a difficult film to make. And a week before we started shooting, our producers announced that we weren't shooting. There was no money, no money whatsoever. And uh, uh, Pierce and I and Richard Wink, the writer, got together and thought, well, are we going to be taken down by this? No money, or will we just press on and hope that money appears? And we decided to press on. But it couldn't have been done except for this guy. Um, But I'm going to come back to Mark before I go back to that. And that is, later, we were an orphan. The, the company that bought the film went bankrupt, and the film was sold to another company in a fire sale, and the movie was sitting there, and nothing was happening. And someone said to me, why don't you ring Mark Fiskin? So I did. I rang him. I said, I'm the guy you know, from all those years ago. Do you want to have a look at my movie that is often? It's nowhere. So I sent it to him, and the next day he sent me a note and said, it's great. Can we have it for the opening weekend? And uh, that started the movie back from the orphanage. Um, it played here in this theater to your neighbors, and within two weeks it had a nine on IMDb, uh, including some of my family, <laughs> I admit. Uh, but more importantly, it has quickly established 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, all because of him. And I did it all without any sleep. Well, <laughs> He gave us a forum for the film to be discovered by you guys and your neighbors and then by critics and, 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 and people. Um, anyway, back to Pierce. Uh, Pierce uh, was born in the early 50s in a little town in Ireland that was established back in the 12th century. So his forefathers go way, way back. Um, he was not born into splendor. It was quite a hard life. His parents separated, and his mum found that she had to go to England to work, just like the mum in Kenneth Branagh's film from two years ago. Um, and that meant that he, uh, Pierce had to go and live with his grandparents, and when they passed, with an aunt and then an uncle, and eventually he had to live in a boarding house where, as he described to me, his part of the room was uh, demarcated by a towel, and he slept on the other side, and the, there was a gentleman who went to work sleeping beside him. So he, like so many people who don't start with opportunity, values opportunity so much. Um, and what that means is when we were in the, really in a mess on this film, I couldn't have had a person who would inspire me like Pierce did. He, 
every day made me feel like I couldn't wait to get to the set because I knew when I got to the set that there would be a father figure who would tell me that I was great. <laughs> who would empower me, who would empower me. But it's not just that. It's not just me. He empowered everyone from the person that was delivering water, you know, to the makeup artists, everyone on the crew, all were carried forward. And I tell you what, every Friday was treacherous because the crew wouldn't be paid on a Friday. They should have been, but they weren't. And eventually they started to go on strike, you know, and we could never have got through it except for the loyalty that they had to this gentleman and his work ethic. Not only has he been in so many great movies that are very memorable, particularly Matador, which played here in 2005 to a rapturous uh, reception. Um, of course, he was Bond in four films, um, which we'll always remember. Um, he's also an environmentalist. He's... Um, campaign to end nuclear uh, uh, testing around the world. He has campaigned for issues of neglected children and educational opportunities for children all over the world. And he's a very kind person. And he's a man of his word. His word is his contract. I give you Pierce Rosslyn. I'm going to give him a prize. Where is the prize? He's the prize, actually. Here it is. Pierce. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Oh. Wow. This is the Mill Valley Film Festival Award. Award for 2023, and I couldn't think of anyone who more deserved it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Let me give you a hug. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's lovely to be in all your company tonight and uh, for me to come back here and share this movie of Fast Charlie with you all. I think Philip has, has spoken volumes about how difficult it was to get this movie made. But uh, uh, well, somehow we got it made. And as much as I might have been a father to him, he was a father to me. A father to me because I love him as a director, I love him as a man. And he, when he came down to our house there in Malibu and my wife Keely made lunch for him and Richard Wink, he said, you know, I am the ringmaster. And he was, he was the ringmaster every day, um, you know, pushing this rock up the hill. Um, it was very, New Orleans at that time was extremely hot and uh, <laughs> one day I went to lunch and I lay down and somewhere on the set I found a, a bed or something to lie down and got up and they said, oh, Philip has just banged his head and killed over. It was about 110 in the garage, but I ran up to the set and there he was with a massive ice pack on his neck, just directing us all. The man kept going and his intellect, his, uh, his passion for filmmaking, and we know this man's work. When you're in the company of someone like that, it's, it's inspiring. So that's what made me get out of bed every day uh, to make the movie. And, uh, yes, I'm very proud of the film. I'm very proud to be with you all tonight. Uh, I cherish this festival, and I cherish the work that you've done, Mark, and the commitment of a community like yourselves, uh, who are inspired people, uh, and especially at this time now in life. <laughs> uh, what stories are we going to tell? How do we tell them? 
Anyway, this is a great home for stories that have heart and conviction and inspiration, intellect and humanity. Anyway, thanks a million. Have a great, uh, a great uh, time here at the movies. <laughs> it's 90 minutes, so there you go. Thanks a million. Thank you, Pierce, and um, I don't know, Philip, if you want to say anything about the movie before we start, or? It's adapted from a novel by uh, uh, Victor Gisler uh, that was set in uh, um, uh, Miami and Orlando, but we transferred it to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi and New Orleans. Um, well, for a very good reason, because there's no rebate in, uh, in Florida. <laughs> There's a rebate in New Orleans, but also because of, of the love that I have for, for Mississippi and New Orleans. Um, Richard Wink came on, wrote the screenplay. Um, there's a lot of stories from the trenches that we'll fill you in on uh, after the screening, so we hope you'll stay behind and have a chat. Please come to the stage. Congratulations. Thanks, what, I, Mark. what I love about this film is it's just such a perfect blend of comedy, romance, and yes, a little violence there. And uh, uh, it just works so well. And I think the testament to a film like this and an actor is that you can't imagine anyone else playing Charlie Swift. So. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's it's wonderful to share the movie with people. Uh, actually, I've only seen five minute, minutes of it with you all tonight. Uh, but uh, the movie has heart. And that came about with, uh, well, it started with the book, obviously. And then Philip, Philip Noyce and I sitting down. Richard Wink, the writer, uh, and I sitting. But this was the one that uh, hit the mark. And so you invest of yourself. <clears throat> and Richard got the, the, a good tempo, I think, of who Pierce Brosnan, the actor, is and who Fast Charlie is as well. So, uh, and then you have Philip, who, who knew where the humor was. Yeah, it, it really works. So congratulations. And we're going to talk more about that, but I wanted to take a, a little time just to talk a little bit from where Philip left off talking about your, uh, your, your life. Um, but I don't want to go necessarily chronologically because uh, there's one factor here that I think is really important, and that is the Mrs. Doubtfire <laughs> factor. We are in the Bay Area. And that was before GoldenEye, uh, if I'm correct. And yes. it was just, I, I wouldn't call your role necessarily a straight man on it, but it was just so pitch perfect. And I knew Robin well, and I think I've read some things that you said, and he was the most gentle, kindest man I've ever met. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. Oh, well, thank you. I love remembering Robin. Uh, Robin Williams, Mrs. Doubtfire, is a big part of my life. Uh, when I got the job, uh, I was so over the moon happy because I had to pay the mortgage that month. And, uh, and then I... <laughs> One always has to pay the mortgage. But uh, here I was with Robin Williams, who was uh, inspirational to me. I came up here on the first day of shooting, and uh, it was a beautiful summer's day, and I'm working with Robin Williams and Sally, and uh, they said, do you want to meet Robin? I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to meet him, please. And he's in the makeup trailer. I went into the makeup trailer, and there was Robin Williams 
sitting there in a Hawaiian shirt and Ugg boots and the head of Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> and that was my introduction to Robin Williams. Uh, and he was always Mrs. Doubtfire for the whole shooting. Robin had to go into makeup at about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and he would just sit there and watch old movies. Um, what can I say? I, I mean, he, he was, that movie, being back in this landscape of life with that movie, The Matador, and now Fast Charlie, is a wonderful circle of time and friendship and community. So uh, I, I cherish that. Uh, Mrs. Doubtfire, Robin just ran amok. I mean, you just had to hold on to your hat when you were working with him uh, because you never knew where he was going to go. Uh, Drive-by fruiting, that wasn't in the script. Uh, I did my best straight man acting. And straight man acting is tricky, actually, because <laughs> you have to listen really hard and find out where the gag is and if you're in the gag. Um, and you always are as the straight man somewhat. But... Um, yeah, Robin, dear man, yeah. beautiful man, beautiful soul. Absolutely. And you mentioned The Matador, which of course we showed in, uh, was that 2005? <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, it was opening night. And that, you were a hit man, but such a different <laughs> role than this one. Could you talk about like this, you know, did you think back to, to that role or was it just like out of your mind and this is a totally different movie? But it's kind of interesting, the, the difference between the two characters. There's something <clears throat> lonely about these characters which draw me in. Uh, as an actor, the mystery of these men, uh, I, I suppose, you know, when I think of... <clears throat> No, it's too complicated. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a very sophisticated audience. I'm not a very sophisticated man. <laughs> I'm just an actor. I, yes. But uh, the hitmen, they just fascinate me. And the cinematic iconography of it all fascinates me. And uh, somewhat, and this has been related to a Western. Uh, and I grew up on Clint Eastwood movies and Steve McQueen movies, as is kind of documented by the remake of The Thomas Crown Affair. <clears throat> <laughs> Got away with something there. But uh, the Matador, <clears throat> yeah, the Matador was just an unexpected surprise. And it's, uh, this is almost a bookend. In, in some respects, it's it's mm, Pierce as the actor, <clears throat> being fully aware of being an actor and fully aware of going onto the stage as a hate man. Uh, but this film has a particular soul to it. Uh, the Matador was a wild romp. Richard Shepard wrote 20 pages of that script, threw it in a drawer, forgot all about it, and uh, came back to it six months later and wrapped it up. Sent it to my company, Irish Dreamtime, my late producing partner, Beau Marie St. Clair. She read it and uh, liked it and made it. And, uh, so it's, it's not, none of this is intentional. It's just beautiful happenstance, really. Yes, and part of it is the art and the process that you as an actor do every time that people don't see mm -hmm. quietly mm -hmm. by yourself, yeah. typically. No, it's all about being alone, really. <laughs> you have to, especially, you know, the theater. I grew up in the theater, and I started my life as a theater actor. <clears throat> but I love the movies, and it's, it's a different uh, creative process in some way, because really, when you shoot a movie, you're shooting rehearsals, unless you have the luxury of doing something really dramatic and have weeks of rehearsals. But mostly, you know, what you see on the screen here is showing up, the location, you have the location for a few hours, you have to shoot it. So 
It's very impulsive, very instinctual. So that means you have to sit in your hotel room or your apartment or your house and sit with a text and try and be interesting. Try and create some emotional context of, of your life as an actor there and then with the character. And Philip touched uh, a little bit on your early life in Ireland and at uh, a young age, uh, re having a reunion with your mother in, in Great Britain and getting into acting and all those memories of the Cowboys and the Indians and everything else and your local movie theater. Actually, the building next door that's adjacent to this theater, theater was called The Lyric, oh, which yeah. I understand was there were two cinemas where I grew up in Ireland, in County Meath, uh, Navin County Meath, yeah. There was the Lyric and the Palace. Yeah. I, I, I maybe saw two or three movies, actually. Uh, I grew up on the River Boyne with my grandparents, family, father that went this way. And my mother, bless her heart, she was courageous enough to be the woman she was in the kind of... Uh, Catholic uh, mangled society that we lived in in the 50s. Uh, so there was a separation, and uh, so consequently, you know, one lived a life of imagination. The first movie, I, one of the most significant movies I saw at the Lyric was The Defiant Ones with uh, Tony, Tony Curtis and um, Sidney Poitier. And so, as a seven-year-old young lad in Ireland, seeing something like that was captivating. The rest of the, of the nourishment was cowboys and westerns, cowboys and Indians, those kind of movies. Um, but that, I think my, then in 64, I left as a young lad of 11 years of age, went to London, South London, and the first movie, the first weekend, <clears throat> August 1964, was uh, Goldfinger. <laughs> so there you go. That's that story. I didn't want to be James Bond. I, I was more fascinated by Odd Job <laughs> and that man with this hat that would take heads off. And there's a beautiful gold lady. Again, you know, 11 year old country boy. Uh, and. Uh, finding cinema. And I understand there was another coincidence that actually Ian Fleming died the day that you moved to London, is that true or? Yeah, it was August 12th, yeah. August 12th, 1964. I didn't know that for many Who years. Who says later. there isn't such a thing as destiny? Ah, well, <laughs> there you have it, uh, destiny. Your let's, destiny is yours, mine is mine. And <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's fast forward a little bit. So you were in uh, uh, doing theater, and uh, I understand that uh, you had some work that uh, gave you an opportunity to come to Hollywood. What would that be like as for you coming from, yes, an artist's life, studying art as well, painting, et cetera, uh, drawing, and then winding up at the shadow of Chateau Mormont. Oh, well, uh, uh, I, uh, I've been blessed to meet great women in my life. And my late wife, Cassie, she was the one who said, we must go to America. So uh, that journey started way back there. Uh, and uh, I came to America in 82. Uh, I had done a mini series called The Manions of America, which was about the Irish potato famine. I was the lead in the show, unknown, and my late wife Cassie said, well, we should go there. And I said, I don't know how the hell we're gonna do that. She'd just done a D James Bond movie, For Your Eyes Only, and I had done the mini series. We made a, had a nice packet of money. We just bought a house which I still have, actually, in Wimbledon. And, um, I bet it's appreciated it somewhat. It's appreciated somewhat. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, how the course of your life, how, how opportunity comes along. And that was certainly one of those occasions of coming to America, getting two grand from the bank manager, an overdraft, coming to LA in 82, 
renting a car from rent a wreck driving across Laurel Canyon and going for an interview, and they were looking for Remington Steel. Boom. <laughs> Somewhat is close to that. That's and really uh, 95 or so episodes later, um, uh, things had changed quite a, quite a bit, and it was all, I presume, happening very quickly. Um, but uh, I guess most people, maybe a lot of people have heard this, that you were offered James Bond years before you actually had the opportunity to do GoldenEye. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's all in the memoirs. I have to write the memoirs. It's so boring to write the memoirs. Uh, but yes, I mean, the glory of Remington Steel, the joy of Remington Steel, to be in America, to be on TV, it was intoxicating and it was hard work. And in 86, they canceled the show, Remington, Brandon Tartikoff, God bless him, um, he canceled the show. And I was offered James Bond, uh, The Living Daylights. However, there was, a, there was a clause in the contract where MTM had 60 days in which to resell the show. And during those 60 days, I had the script of um, The Living Daylights right beside the bed. I would look at it every now and then and close it because the contract hadn't been made. And we were assured that I would get out of, the, out of Remington Steel. Uh, and I did the wardrobe fittings for the show. I did photographs with the late Cubby Broccoli down at Pinewood. And the days ticked on, ticked on. 60 days was the clause. Uh, and around day 58, 59, Cubby said, look, you can have them for six episodes, but no more than six episodes. And day 60 came round, and my late wife and I, and children, my stepchildren, child, uh, we were living in the Malibu colony, and I remember going to the refrigerator. It was day 60, and we were sure that everything was going to work out. And I got a bottle of Cristal champagne out of the fridge. I was walking out to the beach to see her. The phone rang, I thought, oh, okay, hello, how are you? And it was the agents from CAA, and they said, the deal is off. Uh, they want the option of 22. Cubby's not gonna buy it. It's not gonna happen. And that was it, it was a Friday night, it was 6.30 in the evening, and uh, that's how it went down. So, opened the champagne and had a good time and carried on looking for work. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I read something that you wrote at some point. Maybe I'll read it at the end, but that seems to be a philosophy of yours to, uh, you can worry a bit, but when it comes down to it, let's move on, enjoy yeah. life. Exactly. And, and uh, after our, over 100 films, that was my last count, not counting the new films that are right. already listed on IMB, IMDb. Uh, it was 100. Um, so why don't we, uh, since we're never going to get through all the 100 films, <laughs> why don't we bring Philip Noyce in and talk about Fast Charlie? Please do. And we'll leave some time for questions, hopefully. If you The hot seat. <laughs> now, Mr. Noyce, was it true? Um, so why don't we go back to the beginning of Fast Charlie and, and uh, I can ask you, how did the two of you get together? Was there a friendship before um, in terms of this film? Well, we kind of knew each other. We had mutual friends. Lots of mutual friends. Lots of mutual friends. Bruce Beresford. Bruce Beresford, Martin Campbell, filmmakers, Bo and Lloyd, my you know, good pals. I think uh, Pierce uh, 
gave me more credit than was due just because I was Australian. Uh -huh. um, That's true, he actually. Had some but good experiences with Australians. <laughs> so when we started talking about this film, he said, "Well, you Australians," with a big smile and great admiration. <laughs> so I thought, "Okay, good." Paul Hogan, thanks again. Well, you are. You're quite brilliant. I mean, as filmmakers and as people, and you as a man are quite extraordinary. I think it was probably because in Australia we learned how to make films on the smell of an oil rag and how we had to fight, fight, fight yeah. against uh, the Americans who owned the cinemas, to be honest, and the Brits who owned the cinemas, and we didn't own any cinemas, and we couldn't get in to the cinemas, and we had to start our own cinemas, and pretty soon we moved into their cinemas as well. <laughs> Just uh, like the we Irish. ourselves the new wave. <laughs> there you go, the new and wave. And well. sort of uh, had brushed shoulders with the new wave and thought, well, if there's one more new waiver, he must be okay. <laughs> uh, that's, that's about the long and the short of it, really. I mean, we hit the ground running. We got on well together. Uh, first lunch we had, as I said before, you know, Philip said, I'm the ringmaster, and he was the ringmaster, and he charged ahead. But there was always a, there was always a, a great intellect and intuition that you trusted. But then there was the famous uh, uh, dinner famous between Pierce and I, where my wife and 12-year-old came to dinner. Uh, they just arrived, and Pierce uh, announced at the dinner, which was a celebration that we're about to start, that he was leaving, leaving the picture, um, which I... <laughs> no money. No money, yeah. Where's the money? <laughs> What's there happening? Was, there was no money. He'd been <laughs> promised uh, to be paid a certain amount. There was no money in the bank. We didn't have any money. And he was supposedly out the door. And that started what you saw, the 26 names at the beginning of the movie, executive producers. Well, the first 10 came in the next day. And we held him there. <laughs> so he was actually playing an, an old showbiz trick, which is, I'm out of here. And he, he, he actually motivated the first money to come back in. So we kept going. We did, for a week. And then, <laughs> and then something else happened, and uh, we then the, figured that one out, and that, then we kept that going. Scene, that scene where he, does the, where he tells the story about his father, on that day, the crew went on strike five times. I had no idea. I was acting the way I was deep I'm, in the role. <laughs> really. I'm trying oh. <laughs> to pretend to him that, it, that they're not on strike. So you don't know this, but remember how I kept saying, let's try another rehearsal? Yeah. Yeah, that was because outside the DOP was trying to persuade the lighting people to turn the lights back on. So glad you tell me this now. Really, I'm so glad. You know, it's a big scene. You've got the words, you've got the pages, you've got the time, you've got a great actress like Marana right there with you. And ah, I'm so glad I didn't know that. I'm so glad I didn't know that. It's so hard enough as it is. But I actually, at the end of the day, I remember going out on the street. Uh, and I'd finished my close-up, finished my side of the scene, and yet everybody was outside. Everybody was outside because they weren't paid, and they were walking off the set. <laughs> so well, I'm glad but, you know, you The movie work. was such a, uh, a, a, a schmuzzle, such, a, such a, a, a mess, that it became an aphrodisiac to all of us because we were determined not to be put down by the situation. So we just tried that much harder. And as I said, it's because of the man that we tried harder. And this is a guy you want to impress. He's just got, I don't know, he demands it through his, through his goodness. <laughs> yes. well, I have a feeling, Philip, you're quite the force, not only on the set, but getting, not taking no for an answer. And, uh, what I wanted to ask you is, I know at the uh, Cinematheque in Paris, they did a retrospective of your work, and they kind of looked at your work in two or three different ways, uh, in terms of 
the Australian films you did, like Rapid Proof Fence, which we showed here in Newsweek, which uh, Newsfront, which uh, launched the Australian New Wave, you and others, and then the big Hollywood action films. Um, and there's probably another phase in there too. We don't need to talk about. But uh, uh, where does where does Fast Charlie fit in well, with you uh, for this? Because it's 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 not a tr traditional genre film, and it's got tremendous acting in it, character acting, the way that Pierce's uh, Charlie is developed through music, through the the visuals of the house, through his cooking. Uh, through everything, and Marcy as well, is really quite extraordinary. So where does this film lie for you? The Australian films I used to dream about, mm. and I didn't dream about uh, any of the American films until this one, but they weren't dreams, they were nightmares. <laughs> um, that's the honest truth. But um, So it interrupted my sleep a lot, this movie. Um, but um, where it fits in is uh, I have a young family, believe it or not. I so I started it. my life three times over, um, and I'm starting it again. And I sort of have the same attitude towards the movies that I want to make. That is, I don't want to keep making the same movie over again. And this was a chance to explore mm. comedy chops um, as well as... as a full-on, well, it's not a full-on, it's a half-baked but full-on flirtation, a half-baked romance. I wanted to explore that. Um, so that's how it fits in. Mm -hmm. One of the best things that happened to us in the making of this movie was that we lost all that money, because we lost a quarter of our money, and we had to take 20 pages out of the script. Now, those 20 pages meant we had to rethink the whole movie and how we were telling the story. So from a great big action film, a la The Equalizer, it became much more of a film about relationships mm. um, than, that, than anything else, and about this particular relationship, or the two relationships that are central, you know, the one with Stan and Charlie and the one with, with um, uh, Marcy and Charlie. Um, so the movie, be the movie changed shape for the better. And, and that's why I say, you know, that despite everything that happened, um, and despite cursing and having nightmares every night between the time we started and right up to last night, um, <laughs> <laughs> it was all for the better. And, and so to answer your question, it fits into my uh, uh, desire to not repeat myself. Yeah. Um, and particularly as I get older, which I can legitimately claim now, um, I intend to keep on not repeating myself. Well, that's a, that's a really thoughtful and perfect answer and makes a lot of sense. Um, so did you have to learn your lines all over again? Or, or, uh, uh, when the, or did no. you come in after that? Part? No, there was definitely a, a remorse over losing scenes and a diminishment sometimes in my heart of what was, what was happening here because of the financial structure and fragility of it. You go, you're kidding me? We're losing that scene. However, the effervescent nature of Philip and the sheer determination would drive me on. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a good rapport between the two of us. And you take the blow and you move on. You lose that scene, you lose that action moment. But, but it meant we had to reach into ourselves and really think with Richard every night yeah. what we were doing and why we were doing it. I'll give you an example. Originally, he was meant to be in that uh, elevator shaft with Marcy. And the two of them were holding on to each other in the original script. Yeah, which was a v very sexy scene because <laughs> uh, the restraint within this movie is something which is really tangible and delightful to see and to play. But yeah, in, the, in that scene in the in the laundry shirt, I get shot, and he's doing everything that you see he's doing, but if you can imagine that Marcy was there as well, and they're both trying to be quiet. So, there you go. <laughs> but what happened was that Marcy didn't join until day seven. Mm. We had no Marcy. 
we, ha we had to start shooting without Amasi. Then we found Marina, she could only come on day seven. So on day six, we had to shoot him in the, in the elevator shaft <laughs> without her. Uh, and we tried, but we just couldn't. <laughs> we, 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 you know, would have meant we were down for a day and we couldn't afford to be down for a day. We only had 25 days to shoot the whole picture. If you had less money, you would probably have to kill them in the laundry shoot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about James Kahn and uh, Stan a little bit, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, the role of, <clears throat> the role of Stan uh, is such a beautiful father figure role, father and son. I mean, we've heard it tonight, father, men who, you know, at a certain age, you and I calling me a father, me calling you a father. We are fathers to each other and mothers to each other, as we all know. But to get uh, to work with James was a very powerful experience and, and one that was extremely intimate because, <clears throat> you know, Jimmy was at the end of his days here um, and he knew it. He, his body had gone through so much trauma with his physical prowess and stamina as an actor, as a man who really held the stage. And now he was in his chair, uh, and but still with that actor's energy and that glint in his eye. And he would be, he would come onto the stage and give us all hell, give Philip hell, <laughs> uh, in a lovely, quiet way, because he was striving to be this character. And he really was, he, he embraced it. Uh, and for a full week, we, we, we shared the day, coffee and tea and stuff like that. It was one morning, we were going through the scene, we're sitting in the, he was sitting in his chair and uh, you know, the breaths were coming hard because he was on his respirator and uh, he's just trying to remember the lines. And, uh, was holding his hand, and he said, oh, I'm going to the dark side, Pierce. Going to the dark side. I said, oh, all right. I said, well, maybe we should just have a cup of tea first. Let's have a cup of tea, Jimmy. <laughs> have a cup of tea, and we just rumble through the lines. Don't worry about it. So, you know, it was, there was that intimacy, and, um, he he was magical to work with, and Philip would roll the camera, and we would start the scene, and and it was impossible to tell whether we were whether what he was doing was method, or whether we were filming a documentary at times. <laughs> Uh, it was, I think, it was both, because actually, the, the, at the end of that week, and we said goodbye. And that was it, Jimmy Khan is, everyone clapped, we all applauded, Jimmy was in his wheelchair and I went over and I hugged him and said, Jimmy, it was just so brilliant, love you dearly. And suddenly he just kind of said, Pierce, I'll see you in Malibu, okay? And it was, suddenly it was, it was no longer the character, it was Jimmy who was just present and was there. And I thought, you rascal, you've been, you gosh darn actor all the way, <laughs> all the way. He, he'd been the character, and then he was James Kahn just saying goodbye to me, and we had a quiet talk, and all of, all of the character fell away. It was just the man. And uh, we said we'd see each other again. There you go. I did tonight. <laughs> right. Well, um... I want to thank you both, and uh, there's so many. From the you want to ask some questions? Have the audience ask some questions? This Do you guys is, have any is, questions? This is my okay. crowd. All right, okay. <laughs> we have the they, mic <laughs> running here. Okay. Hi, yeah, I saw this film at the film festival and absolutely loved it. And so thank you so much for the screening. But what I noticed this time is as soon as the movie started, I was just bowled over by the score. And I thought, how did I miss that the first time? 
So tell me about scoring this film. It was just, it's I just It's one guy it. playing 13 instruments. There is a, there is a, a, a video, if you go, if you're on um, Instagram, Phil, uh, Phil Eisler, Eisler, Eisler. Phil Eisler is the name of the composer. And he, um, he played all, and in the video you see him playing all 13 instruments himself. Um, there was so little money for the score, he just uh, did it in his studio and, uh, and, and recorded himself and overdubbed himself over and over. And the last song in the movie, Clarence, Citizen Cope, is a pal. He's a good mate. And so uh, I sent him the script. My wife, Keely, said, Clarence should put a song in. So we sent it to him. So that song at the end, Victory March, is Citizen Cope. But uh, f yeah, Phil Eisler, um, uh, are you on Instagram? Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Well, um, it's, a, it's a great five-minute video that he's made. You, you can find it. He, he did, uh, um, uh, he did um, uh, revenge for me for six years. That's where I found him. Um, he came in and, 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 and then he did the series. Um, and then he did um, the, uh, the series about the, the family of musicians in Chicago. What was that called? Empire. He did that for eight years. So, and now he's just done um, Out of Banks, the one on Netflix, uh, as well as movies. To answer your question, it's all about the preparation. Mm, yeah. Pierce came down to New Orleans. We went off to the Mississippi uh, uh, coast and Biloxi and introduced him to as many people as possible from a wide range of characters that might appear in his life uh, on the dark side and the bright side and, um, uh, and, and discussed the movie in advance. But he's completely right. I never told him on the set what to do. All I was doing was providing him with the opportunity to record the decisions that he'd already made and then to catch them, to catch the lightning in the bottle. Any other questions? And, uh, and, 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 and allowing the actors to, 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 they've got to be prepared. You've got to be, have worked before with them, not on the set. There is no time on a film like this, absolutely no time. You know, 25 day shoot, um, and, and even then we had to finish early every day because we had to, I knew we were going to need some more money for post, so <laughs> we were trying to save money by finishing an hour early. Uh, I've got a quick question, question for Pierce. Pierce and I have actually known each other for some time. He's been very, very kind to me. Hello, Tom. Hi. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of wondering, uh, well, one of the things Pierce did for me is, is he did a promo on a documentary that I did uh, called Living on a Dollar a Day. And that got us a lot of attention and we won many awards on the documentary. And, it's, and he took the time to do that just because he's a great guy. Uh, and I, I kind of want to know, you've been very busy in your life and where have you gotten the time and the energy to be as philanthropic and as kind to so many people as you have been? So many people uh, put all of that stuff aside when they get as busy as you, but you've managed to put that first on your list. Uh, everything that people have said about you tonight, about being a good guy, <laughs> is absolutely true. I remember the first time we met, you said I was a good egg. You're the good egg. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well. There you go. One tries one's best in life to do good things and to show up on time. But so nice to see you again, Tom, after all these years. And that's it. Um, what can I say? So far, so good. Uh, what I'm going to do next, I have no idea what I'm going to do next. Painting uh, has been a part of my life for many decades. So I've been showing my art and stepping out onto the world stage of art. Uh, uh, and that's exhilarating. 
Uh, I have movies that I want to make in Ireland, and I have movies that Philip and I have a project, uh, which we both like, and Richard Wank likes it, and we work well together, and that's a possibility. So there you go, it's all about doing. All about doing. Uh, we have a woman right there. Thank you, that was very exciting. Was there a magic moment in the film, in the filming, or one of the scenes, something that was that scene that you'll always carry with you from the uh, Well, yeah, James Caan, <laughs> uh, sitting with Jimmy, watching Jimmy do his thing, watching the camera being turned on, sitting in the, in the proscenium arch of the composition by Philip and, and, and you know, uh, just watching James Caan improvise do his thing. I, th <laughs> I don't know if you saw it, but this is, I, I wear short pants. I thought it would be clever to wear short pants. Look because, great. <laughs> these, these Irish knees, these bony knees. And I thought, oh, this is going to be so funny. The two of us are eating birthday cake and the camera's going to pull back and you know, I'm going to look kind of cool up here, but then look ridiculous down here with bony knees. And we shot the scene, and I thought, that was really clever. And I didn't look closely enough because the scene continues into the room. And then I had to spend a whole day in front of Jimmy Khan saying, what the God, Dad, what are you wearing, for God's sake? What is that? My God, where did you get those knees? And you're trying to be a cool hitman, and you're trying to be in, God damn it, what are those knees? Okay, what's my line? Ah, never mind. What are you wearing, Brosnan? Uh, so there you go. Forgot about that moment. I think the line uh, that really stuck with me was, uh, don't fall in love with me, Charlie Swift. And you go, it's too late. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good line. It's a good line. We shall see where it Straight goes. Straight out of a western. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, but I do want to thank which one. Thank the audience again for coming out and and being uh, so enamored with this film. And please tell your friends. So oh, I can I can ask you to go even further than that. Okay. <laughs> Is there a tin can we're going to put no. around? No, 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 no. Something worth much more than money. And that is, if you like the movie, go on IMDb, because that's all we've got, is the free platforms to promote this film. That's all. The pr distributor has spent 25 cents on us. And uh, we so if you, if you feel like it, go on IMDb or uh, Rotten Tomatoes, uh, IMDb in particular. Bring us back to the score that we had when we left here last time. <laughs> Thank you, Noel Valley. Lots of love. Thank you. Thank you.